I wanted to start by thanking Cambridge University Press for inviting me, but thanks to Rupert. Now, I also know I need to thank King Henry VIII. So thanks to Henry VIII as well. So um, my talk is about professionalism in English language teaching. And this is the map of my talk for your information. <coughs> I have been asked to talk to you about professionalism. So I think a good place to start is to come to a shared understanding of what we mean by professionalism in English language teaching. I will be drawing on a number of sources for this. But this is not really, I don't, this, I don't want this to be an intellectual exercise. I want this to be an exercise in reality checking, in basically using these ideas around what is professionalism in English language teaching, for you to use them as a benchmark for your reality. So how do those ideas compare with the teachers that you have in your organization and in your context? Then I want to move on and talk a bit about the threat posed by the non-professionals. And I'm going to spend a bit of time around that because I think this is a very interesting industry in that respect. Um, then I want to situate professionalism in English language teaching by comparing it to other professions. So how, how do we compare with them? But also in different contexts, actually in your context. My fourth moment, if you like, or section is around initial teacher training and how initial teacher training programs actually prepare us for the challenge of teaching with excellence. And finally, I want us to think about what we can do to further professionalize the sector. I think here um, you're safe to, th to if you're thinking, oh, she doesn't think that this is a very professional profession. Uh, more about this later. So let's get started with defining professionalism. And I'm going to be using different sources. And as a language teacher, there's always a temptation to look it up in the dictionary. So that's where I'm going to start, actually. Then I'm going to be looking at um, continuous professional development frameworks <coughs> and how they define what is the knowledge and the kinds of expertise that English language teachers need in order to be, do their, to be doing their job successfully. And I'm going to briefly tell you some insights from the teacher education literature. So let's get started. As I talk, I would like you to engage with this question. How does the description of what it means to be an ELT professional compare with the English as a foreign language teachers that you have in your organization and in your context? So bear that in mind, so that, that reality check. So let's get started with the dictionary. And as we are in Cambridge, let's look up <laughs> the definitions from the Cambridge Dictionary. I'm not going to ask you to read it all. I just want us to look at the sort of striking words and the recurrent words around professionalism and professional. So we've got words around uh, people being trained and skilled. And the training and the education is of high level. Um, and it's specialized, special training or education. And a certain type of skill that these people develop, that they're effective, that they're organized, that they're serious in terms of manner. I also, just to look at something different, <laughs> um, I looked at uh, Visual Words, which is a visual um, online dictionary. And uh, what I found particularly interesting is that there's a very strong connection between professionalism and expertise. And that line in green actually means that professionalism is described or defined as a kind of expertise. So as part of my exploration, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time unpacking expertise. The Cambridge Dictionary also asks us to compare professional and professionalism with amateur. And interestingly, the amateur is somebody who does something for pleasure and not for a job. And there's also this dimension of not making money for it, which of course the professional does, in theory. Let's move on. So to sum up, really, the exploration of the dictionary tells us that professionalism is a kind of expertise acquired through education and training at a high level. What the dictionary doesn't tell us, so the remaining question is, what kind of expertise, of course, do English language teaching professionals need to do their job successfully? And that's why I continued my exploration by looking at the continuous professional development frameworks. So I looked at three. I looked at the Cambridge English Teaching Framework, at the British Council, uh, the Teaching English Continuing Professional Development Framework for teachers, and the European Profiling Grid. 
I'm not going to bore you with the details because we would be here until after dinner. But basically, I'm just going to give you the headlines. And what I, I, I wanted to do was to compare the three in terms of the, those areas that they identify of professional competence and skill. And it was an interesting exercise to do. Comparing the three, I'm going to use a sort of RAG, red, amber, green system, to show you those areas that are mentioned across the three professional development frameworks. So there, seem to, there seems to be an agreement or a consensus that these are the areas of knowledge and expertise. Some areas mentioned in two of the frameworks and some areas mentioned in just the one framework. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to read all that. I'm going to summarize the, the, the green area, the area where the three frameworks seem to agree that these are the key areas of expertise. But interestingly, I was surprised that in the European profiling grid, there is nothing at headline level on the skills around understanding learners and learning, which I think in the 21st century is quite interesting. And also in the, in the European profiling grid, there are a number of areas that do not feature in the other professional development frameworks around education and training, i.e. what education and what kind of training is required of teachers, assessed teaching. So do, have these teachers been through assessed teaching practice, teaching experience, intellectual, um, intercultural competence, after all this is a European framework, digital media, which in the Cambridge um, English teaching framework is treated separately, they've got a separate framework for that, and sort of the wider administrative tasks that teachers have to do. So those are the, the areas where there is no agreement. Now, to summarise the areas where the three frameworks seem to agree, and there is consensus that these are the key areas of knowledge and expertise that teachers need to develop and have, the three of them agree that um, on an area around the teacher's own language ability or proficiency and awareness. They call it different things, but they all agree that this is an important area, that teachers need to know their subject. There's also agreement around planning language learning, both at course level and at lesson level. So, of course, we need to know how to plan, don't we? An area of agreement around managing language learning, assessing language learning, and around professional development, either how you develop yourself, but also including things like values and professional conduct and ethics. If we look at them, they're all mostly practical, but they're all informed by formal knowledge. So, we've described professionalism in terms of dictionaries and the professional, the, the CPD frameworks. Now, let's look briefly at what the teacher education literature has to say about this. For this, I'm going to look at four sources, Schulman in Borg, Maldres and Weddell, Diaz Majoli and Hattie, and some are within the field of second language teacher education, but I always like to look a bit beyond second language teaching. So I also looked at teacher education and educational research. So, in terms of the teacher, the, the knowledge and the expertise that teachers need to have, Schumann identified a number of areas. One, again, subject matter content knowledge. In other words, teachers need to know about English and they need to know and they need to speak English well. The second area is pedagogical content knowledge. Now, this means that teachers need to be able to transfer and to adapt and to organize their own knowledge of language to be able to make it amenable to learners. So it's, the, it's the, how do I present what I know so that learners can learn it? The third area is around curriculum knowledge. In other words, what knowing what the program that I'm teaching and the other programs that you know, came before and come later, what do they include? What materials help me present that, that, that program? What other subjects my learners are learning? This is particularly relevant when we teach in the primary or secondary or further education sector or higher education sector. But also what's called vertical knowledge. So what comes first? What comes, comes later? This is essential knowledge that every teacher should have. Of course, general pedagogic knowledge, learning how to teach, not just English, but things like discipline and classroom management. Knowing my learners and knowing what they're like, knowing what helps them learn, knowing what the barriers are to learning, knowing where I work, and knowing their character the characteristics of my workplace. 
and knowing why my students need to learn this. What is the ultimate goal of this program? So this is Schulman in Borg. Interestingly, Maldres and Weddell identify a completely different set, uh, three different kinds of knowledge. Very simple. The first one they call knowing about. So knowing about the English language, knowing about the different systems, knowing about the different skills. But also fundamentally, a teacher needs to know how. Needs to have skills, teaching skills, personal skills. And the third type, which is even more interesting in my opinion, is what they call knowing to. Now, knowing to is about knowing about and knowing how in the right place at the right time to support learning. So it's about this. It's about being in the moment. And it's about this kind of improvisatory, just like decisions that teachers make. They can't make them without the, the knowledge how and the knowledge about. They just can't. Diaz Maggioli quotes the Association for Professional Development in America. And they write a set of expectations of what a professional teacher should know and should be. They say that every teacher should be educated broadly and well. That every teacher should be knowledgeable about the fields to be taught. No Uranians. They should be familiar with how learners develop, how they behave, and how they learn. In other words, the psychology of learning. And that they should be knowledgeable about and skilled in the profession of education sufficiently to be able to ensure that quality standards are met, that ethics are met, that they have a, a responsible conduct and a responsiveness to the educational needs of the greater society. So not just my little language lesson. Can I ask the room whether you are familiar with the meta research conducted by Professor John Hattie? Any, can you please raise your hands? Okay, not quite. Okay, just a few people. I think, for me, this is the most exciting piece of work in education at the moment. Why is Hattie's work important? Because he's, uh, he synthesised the results of 900 different research reports and studies about what really helps students achieve their outcomes. So how do teachers make a difference? And Hattie stresses that professional experts, he calls the expert teacher, a fundamental. Why? He says that after the students themselves, the greatest source of variance that can make a difference is the teacher. It's not you guys. It's not me. It's not the principal. It's not the materials. It's not the technology. It's the teacher. Therefore, Excellence in teaching is the single most powerful influence on student achievement. Just remember this. And he says something that on the surface is quite thought-provoking because he says teachers' subject matter knowledge and pedagogical content knowledge, the things we were talking about before, they have little effect on the quality of student outcomes. So you're thinking, so what are we saying here, that knowing is not important? No. He's not saying that at all. What he's actually saying is that what matters is how teachers organize and use that knowledge. So yes, they need to know, but there's something even more important. And this is what it is. Hattie says that expert teachers differ from somebody who's been doing the same thing 20 years in the same way in how they organize and use their knowledge, i.e. they have a deeper understanding and a more integrated knowledge of the content they teach. And if you start looking at what he means by that, so what is it that expert teachers do, let's think about what kind of knowledge is being tapped into here. So, expert teachers set challenging goals. They are very sensitive to the context of what's going on. They're excellent seekers and users of feedback information from the learners about the impact they're having on learning. Now, all this is knowing too. So this is a very important message for us and for those of us who are involved in helping teachers develop, grow, and professionalize. Just teaching teachers stuff is not enough. We need higher levels, 
higher order professional development to help teachers be good knowers too. My problem when I look at all this is that I find it a bit dull. <laughs> I find it a bit dry. And to me, I, much as I like all this stuff, the lifeblood of what a professional is doesn't seem to be there. And in my experience, the lifeblood of what a professional is has got to do with other stuff, as well as all that, without denying that. So this is my little list of what a professional, to me, is like. Before everything else, a professional is a creator of a safe and inclusive learning environment. Without that, knowledge just goes. A firmer believer in potential. A facilitator of learning as self-actualization. A professional doesn't just care about teaching my lesson today. A professional cares about educating. A role model of curiosity about language and learning. A successful model of language. A fair assessor, who would argue with that. A congruent practitioner, somebody that has beliefs and assumptions and theories about how learning happens, and you see those in action when they teach. A career-long learner of teaching and learning, somebody who never stops learning. An ongoing analyst on the same theme, an ongoing analyst, evaluator, improver of their own practice, and not just of my own little world of the classroom, but also of my organization, of my field, what Rupert was saying, it's a learner together, somebody who learns with other people. Because of that, he or she is also a peer coach, a mentor, a critical friend to their colleagues, and a team player in an organization. A professional is not a loner. Now, all these things form part of a cognition, teacher's cognition, that's quite dynamic. It's not something that's handed over to us in initial teacher education and we receive it like the tablets of the law. It's something that's you know, informed and refined by my teaching experience, by further professional development. So it's something that grows and develops. And there's, this, you know, there's a sort of mutual interaction between my experience and my knowledge. So we've looked at dictionaries, we've looked at CPD frameworks, and we've looked at the teacher education literature. But what does reality look like? And this is where I want to move on and look at the non-professional threat. I am very lucky to have worked in many different contexts, and I travel a lot because of my work. And the constant feature I encounter is individuals who work as English language teachers and earn money as professionals without having any or adequate or sufficient teacher training or education. I see some people going, yeah, you recognize the, the scene. And in a way, if we, what we describe should be the norm, this could be construed as an anomaly, but is it? And I want to, you know, if I have to sort of categorize the kind of non-professional individuals that I've, I've encountered in my career, I would just create two types, uh, which you may or may not recognize. I, I encounter wherever I go. One is what I call type one, the native speaker conversationalist. You recognize him, don't you? I'm talking about the guy that thinks that in all you need to know to be able to teach English is to speak it. And type two is what I called the B2, but you know, replace the B2 with B1 or C1, certificated user. More about this in a minute. And I'm going to spend a few minutes with each of the types. And I want us again to compare these types with what we said before about what is professionalism in English language teaching. So, type one. The native speaker conversationalist, very, very much in demand. I looked up um, some advertising websites day before yesterday, and of course they're, they're in demand. So native speaker wanted says this ad, I'll just read to you very quickly, lots of money in China, and if you read the small print of the details of the job, now the qualifications that you need to have are to be a native English speaker. So that's a good qualification. <laughs> Bachelor's degree preferred. Don't be over 40, need not apply. <laughs> now, TEFL or TESOL is desirable, but not required. 
Experience preferred, but not strictly required, and what I really like is number six, high spirit of adventures and a sense of humor. So again, this like, no teaching qualifications required. Another case, Russia. Same story, native speaker of English. Now let's look at the detail. The main responsibility of a teacher here is to perform lessons of speaking practice for students of different level and age using board games from time to time. You might be relieved to know that we have a lot of board games. Okay, so this, this, is, this is the kind of profile we are looking for. Again, no EFL teaching qualifications required. Now, let's look at it from the other side. This is people wanting, so organizations wanting this kind, this type. Let's look at this type, advertising his services, yeah? And this is um, a profile from LinkedIn, which I looked at three months ago. This is a real person. Let's call him John. Now, John advertises himself as the na a native speaker conversationalist. And let's look at his qualifications for the role. First thing he says, jack of all trades and master of none. Wonderful. Now, if we look at his area of expertise, it's not clear. It's actually, he says, uh, let me just, before we move on, let me just tell you about his, a bit of, about his relevant experience for the job. I've worked as a customer service rep in retail chains, lower management, and a pharmaceutical chain, a mechanic, and a collision repair technician. So these are the relevant qualifications and experience for the job. And then specialization. The one thing, you, I mean, this is great, isn't it, that I bring to the table in any job I've worked is my personality. Now, you might want to know that I'm outgoing, honest, brutally at times, and diplomatic. How he can be diplomatic and brutally honest, it eludes me, but that's not part of my conversation in my talk, so let's move on. Basically, let's go back to what Diaz Majoli identified as the expectations of a professional teacher, and let's analyze John with reference to that. First thing, educated broadly and well. Let's give John the benefit of the doubt. We don't know, but his qualification, his past experience doesn't seem to give us a lot of indication of that. Knowledge about the field to be taught, knowledge about English. No evidence of that. Familiarity with educational psychology, not really, that we are aware of. Knowledge about the profession of education, no evidence of that. And yet, he earns money like you and me, as a teacher of English. Type two. This is a person, like me, when I was a teenager, who learned English as a foreign language, so lives in a country where English is not the first language, and passed a test of proficiency at some level. Yeah, B1, B2, C1. And this is the strength for which he or she is being employed, having passed a B1, a B2 level of English. Let's look at this again. Educated broadly and well, let's give her the benefit of the doubt, we don't know. Knowledgeable about the fields to be taught. Well, let's give it a question mark because C1, maybe. B1. Familiar with how learners develop, behave, and learn. Yeah, she's had the, the, the experiential knowledge of learning English, but not necessarily the psychological, theoretical knowledge to understand how learners learn. So, no. Knowledge about the profession of education? No. And yet, she earns her living as a teacher of English. An associated um, topic that comes with this B1, B2, C1 certificated user is the issue of language proficiency. And this has been a hotly debated topic in the conference and um, sector, if you like, in the conference circuit and in social media lately. So last year, for example, Cambridge English set up uh, the language debate and asked a very interesting question. What language level does a teacher need to have? And before this debate, um, Cambridge English conducted a survey of a number of teachers, and these were the results. Teachers from all over the world saying at least two um, common European framework levels above the students, 51% of the teachers said that. At least one common European framework level above the students, 
12.9% of those teachers, and native speaker like proficiency, 35.6% of the teachers. In this year's IATEFL conference, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language, um, again, it was a hotly debated topic, so debated and so hot that it went, you know, it went on, on and on and on. And um, for example, the TEFL Equity Advocates website <coughs> took it on and asked this question again. Um, that the question was, what is the minimal, minimum proficiency level for a teacher? And it was the most popular thread in the history of the website. There were 112 comments of teachers talking about this, and it went on in Facebook and in Twitter. So I just wanted to show you a representative sample of the comments there. I've chosen the disturbing ones. No more fun. Um, let's have a read. I'm gonna re I, don't, I don't know if you see this well, so I'm going to read it out loud. If a teacher teaches only elementary level, then surely they only need to be one step ahead of the learners, at best pre-intermediate level. I've seen plenty of one step ahead teachers whose English was bad, but absolutely fine for elementary level, and it's worked well. Moving on swiftly, coming back to this in a minute. Better to take the teachers you can get than no teacher at all. And finally, very quickly, this is a very famous writer and teacher trainer, so I find this particularly disturbing, because he's an, an, influ an influencer. Theoretically, there is no reason that a teacher need know the target language at all. He, she need simply have the pedagogical skills to create the, the conditions for learning it. So that's what people are thinking. Not everybody, hopefully, but you know, that's what some people are thinking. So I want to explore very briefly this idea of one step ahead teaching. <laughs> Thankfully, somebody in the website actually provided the answer, so I don't even have to tell you what I think, because I think that. Uh, and this is a comment from somebody on the website. And he's saying, this was a major problem I saw in Korea. Many teachers with little or no proficiency were forced to teach English with terrible results. I've seen one step ahead teaching, it's not pretty. I've seen one step ahead teaching, it's not pretty. But more importantly, this idea that um, you are bad and you're perfectly fine for elementary. How can English teachers whose English is described as bad be absolutely fine for any level? Can they be adequate models of language in all its aspects? Lexis, grammar, pronunciation, spelling, discourse, you name it. Can they be adequate models? I'm going to ask you to read this for a second. This is, uh, these are two descriptors from the Common European Framework. And I want you to think about whether this, these two descriptors describe a professional teacher. So I'm going to give you time to read them. I don't know what you think. My answer is no. And this is B1. And this is B1. So for me, you know, the, is the one step ahead teacher a professional? My answer to that is no. I was the one step ahead teacher of my classmates when I was 15 years old, and my best friend loved PE but didn't like English. That is a one step ahead teacher. Language teachers are professional language specialists who, whose job is to help learners become successful English language users. The one step ahead teacher doesn't do that for us. Thank you very much. But interestingly enough, uh, my problem is that we always look at the issue of language proficiency with reference to the likes of me, the so-called non-native um, speaker. And interestingly enough, we don't look as closely at the literacy issues around the so-called native speaker. And I would like you to read um, this, these two paragraphs from a postgraduate diploma candidate's assignment. Have a look at it and have a look at that English there. This is a teacher. This teacher has issues with, just by looking at those two paragraphs, coherence, cohesion, order of information, accuracy, referencing conventions, spelling, and punctuation. We need to look at the literacy issue around the so-called 
native speakers. This is important, and it is development material. It is professional development material that I don't know why we don't often look at. It's the elephant in the room. So what is the problem with the non-professionals? Basically, that they devalue competent professionals and that they depreciate professionalism in English language teaching. Hattie recently talked about attacks on professionalism and expertise, and he identified particularly these two. One, when people make strong claims that teachers are born and not made. More about this in a minute. And two, allowing people in classrooms to go unprepared. If you put these two attributes in a person, Alex Moore created a character type, and he calls it the charismatic subject made in heaven. And I want to spend one minute looking at the charismatic subject made in heaven because he is an attack on professionalism. So, John, welcome back. The charismatic subject made in heaven believes in personality. And there's this emphasis on the teacher as personality. What the implications of this is that the qualities of good teachers are inherent. You are either born good or not. Which means then that you don't need training if you have the right staff. Now, if the qualities of good teaching are inherent, if you're born a good teacher, what hope is there for development and improvement? But equally, the charismatic subject made in heaven is over-reliant on his high-profile personal attributes, his popularity, uh, his ability to infuse and inspire students. And in our schools, this is a very popular teacher. That's why we want to keep him, don't we? However, <coughs> let's look deeply. This person normally has a very idiosyncratic teaching style. Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes, as an organization, you want to push for excellence. And you want to identify areas of excellence according to research, etc., etc. He will not play. Normally unprepared, not a planner, not a believer in planning. It's all about me. It's not about them, it's about me. Highly individualistic. And normally an institutional rebel. So again, for any learning together, for any collaboration, for any drawing of you know, standards of quality and professional development, he will not want to play. So I had to conclude by saying, imagine amateurs, no matter how bright, to be doctors or pilots or engineers or dentists with no training. Now, my question is, why is this not just a possibility in our profession, but a widespread reality? This is a widespread reality in our industry. And I want to briefly explore the causes of this. And I, I personally identified three. You might have more and tell me more about it at dinner time or tomorrow. One, market forces. Two, poor strategic planning. And three, lack of public awareness. So let's explore them briefly. Market forces, the famous law of demand, supply and demand. And in many, many contexts, Demand for teachers far outweighs supply. And we resort to desperate measures, don't we? We need to staff. The issue of cost. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but who doesn't need to do efficiency savings in their organization? These are difficult times, aren't they? And you may be tempted to think in these terms. If you think of your teachers if you place your teachers in a continuum from not qualified or unqualified to qualified to really very qualified and expert, and cost, oops, of course, the more qualified, the more expert, the more expensive. <coughs> and sometimes you may be tempted to make that efficiency saving, i.e., let's not renew the contracts of the more experienced and more qualified because they're more expensive and we need to save money. So let's look again or remind ourselves on how expert teachers make a difference. We are in the business of improving learner outcomes. So what sense does it make to save on the expert teachers? As Newell says, why keep pouring scarce resources into a leaking barrel when it is cheaper and more effective to repair the barrel? 
we need to consider how to conserve and develop the workforce, conserve and develop the workforce, make teachers feel valued and self-efficacious. For strategic planning, we've all seen this, where you know, educational reform or reform at systems level requires to make quick changes and we don't really think through the implications for teacher expertise requirements. So we've seen this, we've been here, we've seen, for example, you know, whole governments and ministries of education and, and, and institutions of higher education saying, okay, CLIL, we're all going to start teaching CLIL or we're all going to start English as a medium of instruction by next year. Or, you know, English will be taught in primary schools by, in two years' time without thinking what it actually means for those teachers who actually need to do this job. Finally, lack of public awareness. And this is at many levels. I'm, you know, when I talk to people who are not in our industry and in our profession, they're not really aware of the qualifications that professional teachers need to have. They're not aware of the difference in quality between a reputable awarding body and a reputable teacher training organization and one that's not or spuriously accredited. Or of the difference in quality between a professional and a non-professional teaching service. You know, the less reputable make a feast out of this and they market this to their advantage. So an example of this this landed in my inbox on Monday, Groupon. You know Groupon? Groupon is a sort of deal of the week um, service. Okay, look at that. Accredited online 180-hour TEFL course and two specialist teaching mindfulness courses thrown in the mix. Who wouldn't want that? Um, <laughs> discounted, you know, from 150 to 49 quid. The deal, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically, when you look at the small print, you realize that there is absolutely, in this course, no required observed and assessed teaching practice. So, going back to Maldres and Weddell, does it provide any know-about? Of course it does. You read about it, you watch some videos, you do some quizzes. Does it help these teachers with their know-how? No. Does it help the teachers with the most crucial skill? No to. No. But the public doesn't know this. So, with all this crazy cocktail, is it any wonder that we have a bit of an image problem as an industry? I heard it said that we are the Cinderella of education, or the aromatherapy of education. <laughs> With all the connotations of, you know, not serious alternative, the poor relative, and all that. So, I wanted to actually situate our own profession with other professions and see why we have this perception problem. So, I looked at um, features, common features of professionals in other professions. Doctors, lawyers, architects. And these are the features. They have high social status, they're well paid, they're accountable to their clients for their work, they belong to a professional body, they have had a considerable period of professionally focused education beyond their first degree in preparation for their role, considerable. They keep up to date with developments in the field and they are autonomous. So, for me, as I looked at those results, um, I thought the following, that teaching professionalism, teacher professionalism in our industry really is a socially situated and a very dynamic construct, shaped but very specific. It's very different. It looks very different in many different uh, contexts, what it means to be a professional teacher. But I think what's important here is to think, as a teacher moves from one context to another, which very often happens, is what happens with their training and their development. Say, for example, you trained initially as a primary school teacher, and then suddenly you get a job in the corporate world. Can you safely assume that the learning that you did and the skills that you develop will transfer automatically and easily and effectively from one context to the next? So this is where we really do need to think very carefully about what professional training and development we provide for teachers once they're in the job. So finally, Initial teacher training, I'm going to breeze through this. Here I want to really focus on the short international teaching certificate. And I want to focus on this because at the moment it's one of the most popular 
qualifications in the world, you know, the qualifications, certificate in the world, that was conceived for the private language school sector as a means of training teachers that then work for my school, a very practical, non-theoretical based program based on a very intensive and hands-on apprenticeship model, sit with Nelly, copy what I do, and a viable option, of course, for the native speaker conversationalist, which basically, it's a very good toolkit of techniques and strategies for survival in the classroom, whatever the classroom means. But the question for me is, once that is over, how appropriate is that for working in different contexts and for the higher order professional learning that leads to a teacher being really self-efficacious? As King says, the, the problem with the popularity of this kind of very short one-month course is that because it became popular, it became widespread. Okay? And the candidates doing this course come from very many different contexts. So how well do these qualification programs continue to meet the needs of the increasingly diverse candidature of ELT practitioners? I'm going to move on, but basically to move on, Moore says, we need to abandon the easy answer the one-month answer, in particular those which claim universality. Sometimes I find like it's a little flat-packed furniture kind of program. Wherever I go, it comes with me, and I do the same. I don't, it doesn't matter where I teach anything, at what level, in what country. Finally, what can we do to professionalize more our sector and our industry? What can organizations do? This is the most, if, if you have to keep one message about my talk, this is the one I want to leave you with. As leaders, <coughs> prioritize leadership of learning over simply managing organizations. What do I mean by this? Here are the five most impactful leadership dimensions that have an impact on student outcomes. I'll read this quickly in case you can't see. Establishing goals and expectations, resourcing strategically, planning, coordinating, and evaluating teaching and the curriculum, promoting and participating in teacher learning and development, and finally, ensuring an orderly and supportive environment. And guess which one is the most impactful? Yes promoting and participating in teacher and learning and development. Actually, it's, twi it's got twice the impact as the next most impactful activity. This is why you want to keep your expert teachers, and this is why professional development is the most important activity that we need to be doing. And it's the one that's first to go when we need to make efficiency savings. Don't. Protect it. So, Ensure that teacher professional learning is identified as a priority. And make time for professional learning and make it part of the culture of learning in your organization. Invest in professional development because investment now is saving on costs in the future. See it as an investment. And of course, implement CPD programs that you know work, and not because of your intuition, that there is research evidence that they work. I have no time to deal with those. But basically, headline, classroom-based collaborative professional inquiry. As part of, of um, the, the publications that Cambridge um, CUP are developing and publishing now, there's a white paper called What's New in ELT Besides Technologies, which I co-wrote with Scott Thornbury. And part four of this paper talks about this, collaborative professional inquiry. So once it's um, out, make sure you read it. So finally, let's go back to that comment of better to take the teachers you can get than no teacher at all. For sure, better than nothing. However, these teachers need, sometimes need significant professional development. So it's very, very important that we give that professional development. As Matthew says, we are not going to get better outcomes if we don't have better teachers. So let's just invest in them. Or as Dylan Williams says, love the one you're with. What does this mean? It means let's support the teachers that we already have with ongoing, systematic, 
job and classroom embedded professional learning opportunities. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have no time for questions, but I will appear again on Friday in the panel. So if you want to ask me any questions, or dinner or whatever. <laughs>